Hey folks, Dr. Mike Israel here for Renaissance Periodization. Last week, we gave you simple, ultra easy, straightforward ways to increase your squat. But no doubt many of you have tried the simple ways and have, well, let's say milked everything out of them that we could have gotten. So this week, we talk about increasing your squat with an advanced periodized approach. This one's going to be a bit more troubleshooting specific. This one is going to be a bit more formal laid out, but you will see that it incorporates many of the simple things from before, assumes you're doing the real simple ones, and then lays out a plan to take the most serious kind of possible approach to really increase your squat. So let's take a look. Here's how the sequence is going to work. You're going to do some due diligence on your end and find the actual limiting factors for your squat. Then you are going to perform probably several months of hypertrophy work on those limiting factors, be it that let's say your quads are weak, or be it that your posterior chain is weak, or be it that your overall strength is just meh and everything's pretty balanced. You're going to have your work cut out for you on the hypertrophy end for those weaknesses. After that, you'll go through a strength phase, and then you'll go through a peaking phase. And at the end of that peaking phase, you should hit new solid PRs in the squat, come back around, reanalyze the problem, and continue forward. So, limiting factors. Here's how I would do this. You may disagree with it. You may go slightly your own way, but this is a method I think works pretty well. Questions for you. Do you miss your squats deep in the hole, or do you miss them just at or above parallel? Hold that thought. Next, when you're missing your squats, do you most often miss them very upright, just kind of hip stop moving, or do you miss them kind of bent and rounded over? Right. And you can even, if you don't miss squats, you can proxy these of where you experience the most difficulty in the lift. Is the, the hole very hard for you, or is it just above parallel that's very hard? And are you, when the reps get harder, starting to cantilever over and round over in your back? Or when the reps are getting harder, are you able to stay upright and it's just like your legs feel like you're grinding through? Having answered that, the likely causes or at least reasonable possible causes for these various ways of missing or having trouble in squats are as follows. If you're missing a lot of squats in the hole, then it's probably that your knee extensor strength is a limiting factor because in the hole, your posterior chain doesn't really have much of an effect on anything. And if anything, if your quads are strong enough, what they'll do is they'll shoot your butt up for you, and then you won't be able to raise your back because your posterior chain is weak. But if in the hole, you can't budge out of the hole, that means the quadriceps, which are the primary sorry, only knee extensors humans have to some extent, this, that's pretty true to a large extent, then really knee extension is a limiting factor, and you sort of need bigger and stronger quads if you're missing your squats in the hole. If you're missing your squats or have trouble with your squats at around or maybe just above or below parallel, but you're upright the whole time, it's just overall strength. That position of right around parallel with a squat is actually like the mechanically most difficult position, right? Just at or below parallel or just above parallel, depending on a few factors. So if you're going to be completely well balanced, with your knee extension strength and your posterior chain strength, your ability to push against the ground and your ability to lift your back up after it's bent over, if those are balanced, that's probably where you're going to miss your squats. So then there's not anything, anything off, off balance. You don't really have a limiting factor. You just overall strength needs to come up. And that's a really straightforward problem we know how to fix. And then lastly, if you're breaking, if your squat, you're missing it kind of around parallel or even just above, but you're missing it because you start getting really rounded over, and that tends to reduce a ton of your ability to drive through the floor, then it's probably that your posterior chain is a limiting factor. If you think about this way, if your posterior chain is theoretically strong enough, ultra strong, let's say if you have the quads of a hundred pound woman, but the posterior chain of Andy Bolton, the first person to deadlift 1,000 pounds, you're going to be missing every single squat in the hole, and you're going to be completely upright 
because there's no way 150 pounds can possibly punk you out as far as what you're able to stand up with. Posterior chain is not a problem for you. So you're going to miss a squat exactly like everyone misses a leg press. It's going to be a leg press for you. And then making your posterior chain stronger won't help your squat a tiny bit because you're completely limited by knee extension. So you obviously need to make your knee extension, your quads stronger, right? But if your quads are strong enough to push you above parallel or close, but then you start to round over, that's not really a quads problem. That is a posterior chain problem, and then you need to work on that. All right, that's how you find limiting factors. Not a whole lot of surprise there. Next, you will do hypertrophy work to attend to those limiting factors. Because fundamentally, the biggest issue with weak quads, if we're going to address that and try to really like solve that problem, uh, bigger quads make stronger quads almost every single time. And we're not trying to do some kind of weird like, oh, but what if I don't want to gain weight, blah, 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 if I don't want to gain muscle. If you don't, or if you're not ready to gain muscle, your toolbox for improving your core lifts is much smaller. And there are plenty of discussions for how to do that, but this is the most straightforward, right? So then you design a program to train the limiting factor muscle slash movements, whether it be posterior chain extension or whether it be knee extension, quadriceps, probably first or early in all the days of your program in which they're trained and probably a little bit more often such that if you typically train quads twice a week in your powerlifting program for increasing your squat, you could consider training your quads maybe three times per week and everything else, uh, same or even fewer amounts of times to really hammer home that adaptation. Now, of course, you're going to include all the rest of your lifts sort of as they fit into your recovery demands based on you squatting more or you, you, you let's say, doing more quad work or most posterior chain work, you'll have to reduce the other components somewhat, which is by definition has to happen. If you want to increase your squat and do the most you can to do it, you got to cool it on the other stuff because your maximum recovery volume overall is only a certain extent, uh, one finite thing. And if you take up more of it with squatting stuff, less of it is available for other stuff. So uh, no big deal, but that's not really rocket science, right? And then what you do is you spend a few mesocycles in that hypertrophy work doing mostly sets of five to 10 for those exercises that are going to hypertrophy the muscle groups that are limiting you. If it's quadriceps that are limiting you, you do a lot of quad work. If it's posterior chain, you do not so much quad work and much more posterior chain work. If it's overall, then you do a pretty even mix of posterior chain and quad work. Then it's not so hard. You just kind of train normal. But... I will say this, intellectually, if you figure out, because it sounds like I'm saying, okay, with this quads thing, if it's quads limiting factor, we got some real stuff to work on. It's obvious. If it's posterior chain, we have something to really work on. But if it's overall general strength, it's kind of like it's a mystery. You just keep getting stronger in the squad. Well, no, it's not so much a mystery. It's a mystery solved. The fact that you don't longer have to worry about why is my squat weak is a big fucking deal. A lot of people rack their brains over it, lose sleep over it. How come my squat won't go up? If you know that the way in which you miss your squat doesn't imply that your quads are super weak relative to your squat or your posterior chain is super weak, it just happens to be that you just kind of like, um, you know, miss the squat exactly where you would expect someone who just loaded too much weight on it. You could have a perfectly symmetrical squatter whose posterior chain and quads are just as strong as each other and balance each other out. And if you put one extra pound on the bar, he's going to miss the squat somewhere. And if you know that's where you're missing the squat, then you can kind of say, hey, great, just overall general strength is what you need. And a lot of people who are doing programs under the assumption that it's always a limiting factor that exists can be really sort of like I ripped off, for lack of a better term, because they think, oh, man, I'm going to get my quads so strong and then my squat's going to shoot up. Well, their quads got stronger, but their posterior chain stayed roughly the same. And now the only thing that happened is they're missing the squat in the way their posterior chain would miss the squat and its squat is almost the same. So now they have to bring their posterior chain up. So in, in many ways, not approaching the general strength, if that's the problem for you, but approaching one limiting factor or the other just makes the other limiting factor more pertinent. Now, of course, if you approach the li one limiting factor first to get really, really strong posterior chain and then later get really, really strong quads, your squat absolutely will go up. But you just sort of made a very specific kind of uh, limiting factor for yourself where you could have just gone and trained uh, normally, sort of, quote unquote, uh, even balance and seen some really good gains. It, it depends on how close your competition is, how soon you want to change your squat. If it's all the time in the world, then you can just work on your posterior chain like crazy for several years and then bring up your quads or vice versa. But if it's like you kind of want consistent gains, especially for a meet coming up in six months, it, it behooves you to work on both 
if you are missing your squad on such a way that doesn't indicate one or of the other are a huge limiting factor for you. All right, so after the hypertrophy phase, we've got bigger muscles. We are going to switch our program to no longer work, let's say quads first, because some movements like hack squats or leg presses in the hypertrophy phase, you may even do before squats or instead of squats because they're very specific to quad hypertrophy. But now we're back into general strength and then we have to start squatting first again, right? Not limiting factor work first, not leg press first, but now squats first again. However, we are going to keep in the limiting factor work. If it's the quads that limiting factor, we're still going to do a little bit more volume, even in the strength phase, and keep training hard to continue to get our quads much stronger. And in this style of mesocycle, this next strength block, several mesocycles in a row, you're going to be focusing on mostly sets of three to six repetitions, not five to 10, but some assistance work will occur in sets of five to eight repetitions, like maybe some hack squats, leg presses, et cetera. After that, you're going to do a peaking phase. I've, we have other videos about where pe peaking phases belong and how they're to be done, but basically you do lots of main lift volume in the first few weeks, and then you do a little bit of accessory volume in the first few weeks, and then you pull that after about one or two weeks in a peaking phase, you essentially pull all of accessory volume out. After three or four weeks, you pull the main lift volume out or down significantly. That starts your taper. That tapers down the volume and your fitness continues to stay relatively level under your underlying strength. Your fatigue starts to fall and thus your preparedness, which is fitness minus fatigue, starts to go up. Compete or peak and just hit, hit it at the gym. Wonderful. Big squat PR. Happiness for you, as they say. So... Here's a sample program I have for the hypertrophy mesos and then strength meso one and two. You'll notice that in the hypertrophy mesos, you know, like day one is you just do, uh, you know, sets of five to seven repetitions in the hack squat with some posterior chain work after. This is an example of you miss squats in the hole and your quad extension ability is what's limiting you. So notice we start with hack squats. Now, here's the thing. Sets of five to seven repetitions in the hack squat deep, strict with a pause, will build your quads, not only size-wise, but already strength-wise. If you're missing squats in the hole and you have still have some ability to adapt to training left, you're not like 89 years old or some shit like that, no offense, grandpa, then what ends up happening is your quads have to get stronger doing this and have to get bigger. And then you see really big gains on your squats because that limiting factor starts to become much less of a limiting factor as your knee extension ability goes up. Day two of that program is sets of eight to 10 in the leg press and sets of eight to 10 in the high bar squat, a little bit of posterior chain work after. Notice it's a little bit of posterior chain work because we have a limited ability to stimulate and recover. And we're intentionally saying we need more quad work than posterior chain, because we have assumed here our posterior chain is not the limiting factor, thus it's relatively stronger than our, our quads are. Day three, you do a bunch of light sets with three to six reps in a low bar competition squat, pausing at the bottom, because we wanna keep those technical qualities really, really in line. And we wanna make sure we don't forget how to low bar squat, but we're tired of getting beat up by low bar squats. So we reduce the weight like crazy and do technique slash recovery, uh, recovery session with it. And it works out super, super well. So you have two very stimulative quad workouts in the week and then one uh, easier workout. You get super recovered and you go on to next week and the next week and next week. And each time you put five more pounds on the bar, 10 more pounds here and there. And then after a while, you're way, way bigger quads and way stronger. And it helps to eat during this time too, especially if you wanna magnify this. If you're on a fat loss diet and you're training your quads a lot, they'll stay the same slash grow a little bit. But if you're gaining some weight, eating some good food, even just close to maintaining, but gaining a few pounds during this process, it can really help. First strength meso, you do again, three lower body sessions per week. Day one, it sets a five to six in the high bar squat. So notice we're getting more specific. High bar is more specific to powerlifting competition and actually your low bar competition squat than is something like the hack squat, right? And at some point your chain work after, on day two, we do uh, five to six reps in the low bar squat with a pause. So now we brought low bar back to the equation and we're really grinding through making that stronger. And in addition to that, we do sets of five to eight in the hack squat after. Okay, so still have that assistance volume and that's going to continue to do a lot of strength building for the quads and also a little bit more hypertrophy, even in that strength phase. Day three, light work, a little bit of posterior chain, same, same as last time. Day three doesn't change for almost all these. And then strength meso two, now we're getting into the heavier 
side of strength. So we're going to do sets of three to four in the low bar squat with a pause. Okay, that's a big deal. Some posterior chain work after. Day two, we're going to do sets of five to six in the high bar squat, sets of five to eight in the hack squat, and some posterior chain. So that day two is still a big quad emphasis day for us. Why? Because we need it. We need that, that we know that's our limiting factor, so we're going to push it really hard. Plenty of time for recovery as well. Now, peaking meso comes along, and the example here is that on day one, you do sets of singles and doubles in your low bar competition squat, no pause, real competition style, minimum posterior chain work after, maybe some glute ham raises or something. Day two, you do three to four reps in a low bar squat, multiple sets, this time with a pause. A lot of that is to reduce the external load, but still get you great practice and great stimulus. You do uh, some high bar squatting work for sets of five to eight, because remember, quads are a limiting factor, and we want to keep stimulating them at least for a while during the peak so they don't just slough off our bodies and continue to provide us with that cross-sectional area and strength we so much need in the squat. Bit of posterior chain work after. Now, after two weeks of this roughly like five-week peak, more or less, we're only doing three to four sets of low bar, no high bar, no posterior chain work on that day. Really starting to bring the fatigue down, like we mentioned earlier, bringing down the assistance work. Day three, as always, Sets of three to six reps, light, with our low bar competition setup, no pauses. That's going to really, really increase our technical abilities in the squat. And then eventually, we make all the adjustments. We even reduce the work that we have to do in the main lifts. And then voila, deload, peak, success. Squat has gone up. When you come back around to it in the next off season, your best bet is to go through that analysis one more time and find out where you're missing your squats and think, hmm, what is the likely culprit? Is it all around strength? Is it my ability to extend my knees? Or is it the ability for me to extend my hips and my spine without having a disruption in technique and a folding over? That's more or less the only sort of three ways people miss squats. There's absolutely tons of nuance. There's tons of little weird stuff in between. It's like everything's good, but my knees cave in, all these other problems. But these describe maybe 90% of anything you'll ever see as far as why isn't my squat going up. So either your knees are too weak or the muscles around your knees, your ability to extend your knees sucks, your ability to extend your hips and your spine suck, or both are relatively even and you're just not that strong. And then you need a balanced mix of both. Folks, let me know if you have any insights or any questions in the comments below. Click on all the links, buy all the things. And uh, yeah, if you want, scoot back a week, watch that other video where we talk about the basic super easy squat fixes because some folks will come to this video and be like, oh, this is like brainy nerd shit. Agreed. Agreed. But you can get a much more simplified uh, situation with last week's vid. And if you have like some folks around you, maybe friends in college or something that like they want some help with increasing their squats, but they're like not ready for all the science shit, you just send them that other video, right? And uh, let me know. And then uh, over the next few weeks, hopefully, I'll be biting myself if this doesn't happen, but uh, sort of Scott the Video Guy and I are in charge of the channel after all. Uh, over the next several weeks, we'll hopefully be scooting out to you guys some simple and advanced bench tips and some simple and advanced deadlift tips and maybe even some pull-up stuff because I know you guys are always interested in pull-ups for some weird reasons. I'm just interested in male gymnasts, but uh, before I say anything cancels me too bad, I'll see you guys next time.